Thank you, Jackie. I know what you mean. The story just gets more and more exciting as you go. But we had to stop somewhere. And thank you, Sylvia, also for just the excellent introduction to what we're going to be talking about this morning. I wonder what your definition of a hero is. That picture of the basketball players, that was perfect. The seven foot tall guys and the six foot, five foot tall guys and who was the better of the basketball players, that was perfect. But your definition of a hero is a hero someone who has exceptional abilities who is able to use those abilities in exceptional ways and has exceptional results in everything that he does. Is that a hero on the one end of the spectrum? Or is a hero the person who unlikely is ever going to accomplish anything much in his life, but all of a sudden rises up in the gap and does things that no one ever expected him or her to be able to do? Does anybody remember the name Gilmore Junio? All right, two people. Gilmore Junio from the Sochi Olympics is a Canadian who did not win a medal. And he did not win a medal not because he didn't qualify to be in the final laps, speed skating. He didn't win a medal because he won a... He, he didn't become famous because he won a medal. He became famous because he gave up his position in the final race, skating, to a person that he thought could win a medal, to a Canadian that he thought could win a medal, and, and he did, the other guy did. And Gilmore Junio gave up, gave up the opportunity to shine himself. He's my hero of the Sochi Olympics. We have a little guy in our story this morning who, as you listen to the scriptures, who said of himself, ah, my clan is the least in the tribe of Manasseh. And Manasseh was not a famous tribe either. But out of that tribe, my family is the least. And in my family, I am the least. I am the least. And this is the man whom God chooses to save Israel. Now the situation at this time is that uh, chapter 5 ended with the, the reign of Deborah, the judge, and Israel had peace for 40 years under the reign of Deborah. For 40 years, everything went well. And what happens in our own spiritual journeys also is when things go well, we get comfortable and complacent. And what happened to Israel over and over again, and also now, that when Deborah died, then they became disobedient to God. They became evil. They did uh, wrong. And things eventually, and God does this with us too, things eventually got to the point where God raised up the Midianites as a tribe to call Israel back to God. Now the Midianites were step cousins to the Israelites. They were descendants of Abraham through his second wife Keturah. The Midianites were a marauding band of hoodlums. As, you read it, as we read it in the story, they, they, they took their entire livestock with them and they found wherever it was, the crops were growing and grain was maturing and ripening and they would harvest it. And then they would move on and just keep doing this and pillaging right across the, the Middle East. Well, and if that happens, and of course, if, if you're depending on your crops for your livelihood and you've got nothing, you're stripped bare. And so for seven years this has been going on, and now Israel is at the point where they're crying to God for help. We cannot continue this way. You've got to save us. Gideon, 
the least of the least, is in a cave trying to thresh out a few grains of wheat, taking the, the, the grains off the stalks, hoping to get enough wheat, perhaps, for a loaf of bread. Gideon, the name means hewer, like hewer of wood, or hacker, not, not computer hacker, but, but a hacker of, of, of grain. That's what the name Gideon literally means. And Gideon is, is working in this cave to hide from the Midianites so that they won't find him. I imagine during the night he has kind of walked through the fields to see if he can find a, a stalk of grain here or there, and now he has collected them and he's in this cave and he's beating them to get the grain off of the stalks of, of wheat. That's when an angel of the Lord comes to him. And an angel of the Lord says to Gideon, God is with you, you mighty warrior. And I can imagine Gideon saying, you're wrong on two counts. God is not with us. If God was with us, we wouldn't be in our present predicament. And secondly, I am not a mighty warrior. I am the least of the least. I'm hiding here in a cave. You didn't see that? You're wrong. God is not with us. I'm not a mighty warrior. And then the Lord says, go in the strength you have and save Israel from the Midianites. Go in the strength you have. You know what I have? A stick to beat some of the kernels of wheat off of a couple of stalks of grain. Go in the strength you have. You are wrong again. This is not going to work. I am not your man. This is a bad plan. You better go to someone else. And then the Lord says, but I am with you, and I will help you. Now, God says that to us. God says, I am with you, and I will help you. I will be there for you. I will give you wisdom and strength and courage and all that. But it doesn't always seem to feel that way to us, does it? It doesn't seem like God is with us and that he is going to be there for us. And, and you would expect that Gideon would say, well, all right, in that case, I'm ready. Just show the way. But it doesn't happen that fast. It's what you have to enjoy this about reading the Bible. These people are real people. Gideon is a real person who has a very, very low self-image and who does not think he can accomplish much. So he's not right away going to say, well, okay, okay, you say uh, you're going to deliver us, okay, I will lead you. He has to work this through his system. He's got to process this information. And so he invites the angel of the Lord for lunch. This is Eastern hospitality as it is known, strangers are invited. We've got some bread, we've got some meat. We're going to put that together, we'll have lunch, and then we'll talk about this, because I'm not so sure it's going to work. The angel says, well, put that, that meat and that bread on a cold rock. And the angel touches it with his walking stick, and the rock blazes into fire. Now that gets Gideon's attention. And so, so God, as through this angel is speaking to Gideon, is saying to him, I am in this. This is for real. We are really going to do this. But the first thing you've got to do is get your house in order. If God is calling us to do some great work for him, we have to be spiritually aware. We have to be spiritually in place, in the right place. And so what, what God is asking Gideon to do at this point is to destroy the heathen altars. His father Joash, as all the people, that's what has happened now since Deborah has been judged. All the people went to Baal and they... they uh, raised their Asherah poles and they had phallic symbols and fertility uh, gods and sacrifices on altars and all kinds of things. And 
Uh, God is asking Gideon to destroy that. So Gideon does, only just to show how scared he is. He does it during the night. He's not going to do this out in the open with everybody watching. During the night, he destroys the Asherah poles. He ruins the altars. And in the morning, the people wake up and everything's destroyed. They're, all of their symbols of their religion are destroyed. And the people get very upset with that. They discover eventually that Gideon is the one who has done this. So they come to Joash and they say, Joash, we've got, to, we've got to make this right. Gideon has to be brought to justice and we're going to have to kill him. Baal, Baal's name has been desecrated. And as you read this story, Joash has a little fun with these people because Joash says, is Baal, is Baal that weak? that he needs a protector? You, you need to protect Baal? Let Baal take care of Baal. So Joash refuses to help them bring Gideon to justice. But Gideon is still not ready quite to get on board with God to lead this army to defeat the Midianites. The Midianites, by the way, are a huge force uh, an army of 132,000 people. 130,000. 130,000 people. Gideon knows that. They're, they have that reputation. So he's not quite ready to get on board. He still needs to argue with God about whether or not this is ever going to work. So he, he invents this story of the fleece or the, the, the thing about the fleece. And you've, if you know anything about Gideon, that's kind of what we know about Gideon. The story of the fleeces. Some people say you should never test God. Well, God says, through this story to me anyway, God says, if you're having trouble believing me, ask. Go ahead. I can deal with your questions. I can deal with your doubts and with your fears. Come to me. Ask, and we'll, we'll sort it out. So Gideon says, I, I need to have uh, a sign that this is really from you, that you are really in this. I'm going to put a fleece, a lamb's fleece, on the ground. And in the morning, I would like that fleece to be wet with dew and all the ground around it dry. God says, okay, we can do that. So Gideon gets up in the morning and he wrings a whole bucket full of water out of that fleece and the ground all around is dry. And Gideon thinks about that a moment, and he said, oh, I, I think I did this the wrong way around. Of course, the fleece would attract the dew. I should have done it the other way. The fleece should be dry, and the ground all around it wet. So, do you mind, God, if we just do this again, only in reverse? God said, sure. Whatever you need, whatever you need in order for it, it to be real to you that I am in this. So they did it in reverse, and sure enough, it worked in reverse, that the fleece was dry, the ground was wet. And Gideon believed. Now, the battle hasn't even started yet. I mean, there isn't, there's, there's no defeating the Midianites at this point. All that has happened so far is getting Gideon in the place where he can believe that what God is asking him to do, he can do. That's all that's happened so far in this story. The Midianites is a force of 130,000 people. Gideon now believes that with God's help, he can defeat them. So he goes on a recruiting drive to find as many men as he can to face this huge army of the Midianites. And he recruits 32,000 people. Um, I, I, math is not one of my strong suits, but I think that's about a ratio of four to one. And the war in those days was face-to-face, man-to-man combat. So if you're outnumbered four to one, the odds are not in your favor. God comes to Gideon and says, 32,000 men, we've got a problem here. And Gideon says, you got that right. And he thinks God is going to say, we've got too few people. But God says, we've got too many. 
And if you listen carefully in that reading, what God says, you've got too many if you are going to believe that I am delivering you from the Midianites. That's what we've got to come to, that I am delivering you from the Midianites. It's my plan, it's my idea, it's my battle, and I will defeat the Midianites through you. And you're not going to believe that if you're only outnumbered four to one. So get rid of all of those people who are shaking in their boots, who are terrified. We don't need any scaredy cats. We don't need anybody who's, the moment they see the, the Midianites coming toward them, are going to cower in fear. And Gideon sees the, the principle here, but he's hoping, of course, that that's not going to be too many people. And when 22,000 people leave, he's left with 10,000 soldiers. Now he's outnumbered 13 to 1. And God says to him, we got a problem here with the numbers, and Gideon says, you got that right. There's too many, God says. Still way too many. 10,000 is too many. In order for you to believe that I am giving you the victory. Too many. Get rid of some people. Now, you take them down to the brook, and um, there'll be some people who, by nature, they, they'll pick up some water out of the brook and drink it out of their hands, and there'll be others who stoop down and kneel at the brook and put their face in the water and, and uh, lap it that way. And then we'll sort that out, and we'll see what we're left with. The strategy here is that if you're going to stop to kneel and put your face to the water, that's going to take a long time, and time is of the essence. The people you need are the ones who will scoop the water in their hands and drink it out of their hands. So separate those out. And Gideon's left with 300 people. Now he's outnumbered 40 to 1. The, the, the battle, I can see, Jackie, you wanted to keep on reading because the, the battle gets exciting at this point. It, it's better than any war games on, on your little eye thingies that you're, that you're playing with. Uh, the best battle strategy that, that you can possibly devise because with 300 people, 300 people, God's going to defeat the Midianites and they're outnumbered 40 to 1. What they do is each of the 300 people gets a torch that they put inside a clay jar. It's a torch and a trumpet. Doesn't look like a real powerful army at this point, does it? Except that the Midianites will believe that by the war standards of the day, every torchbearer represents a thousand people. And every trumpeter represents a thousand people. Are you doing the math? That will mean to the Midianites there are 300,000 people in the Israelite army that are going to come against them. And they are going to believe at this point that they are outnumbered three to one. And they flee. Isn't that amazing? That's what God does. What has that got to do with us, you might ask? Well, if you can identify with Gideon that he's the least of the least of the least, we might be able also, I think, to legitimately say, you know what, we're Christian reformed. In the grand scheme of things, what's Christian Reformed? Most people, even today, after we've been around for 60, 70 years, still saying never heard of it. Christian Reformed. We are a little, 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 little denomination in the grand scheme of things. And then we're in Chatham, Kent, Ontario. I know, Chatham, Kent's a pretty good place. But it's not a world center. 
it's, it's not a, a shaking place. It's, well, you know, in the grand scheme of things, kind of down there somewhere. Where Grace CRC, a significant church in Chatham-Kent, but not St. Paul's or the, the church at the end of that road, what's the name of it? Yeah. If we're not that, just a nice, nice little church. You know what God does? God takes little people like you and me. God looks around and God says, I need you and I need you. And you say, who am I? Who am I? What could you possibly use me for? And God takes the little guy and God says, you and me together, you and me together are an invincible power. You see, God's got a big job on his hands, right? God has a world to redeem. God has a world to redeem. He's got a culture to redeem. And he needs people like you and me. Not important people, not powerful people, not wealthy people, ordinary people like you and me who will be used by God to defeat the enemy. The enemy that we run into day after day after day, beginning in our own lives, but then also seeing around us that God wants to destroy evil. God wants the good in his kingdom to flourish. And he's calling on you. Shall we pray? Our God, we see Gideon, and we like stories like the story of Gideon because um, we like the underdog, and, and we like cheering for the underdog, and we think that's really great when, when a man can come out of hiding in a cave and lead an army to defeat this huge Midianite force. We like stories like that. Only this isn't a story just, it's, it's how you operate. It's your modus operandi. It's you choose us to do something for you that will destroy evil in our world, beginning in our own hearts and lives, and then extending beyond us as we see opportunity, as you call us. I thank you, Lord, for Grace Church, and I pray your blessing on this congregation. I pray that you'll continue to bless Pastor William, the leadership of the church, council, membership. May we be a bright light in a dark world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of response is, You are my all in all. And we'll stand to sing. <laughs>